Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Well, my name is Harold Javid. I would like to welcome you to our session on um, large-scale data analysis. And we have uh, four exciting presentations in the next two hours. And uh, so without much uh, delay at all, I'd like to begin by introducing our first uh, presentation on the subject of uh, Gray Wolf Petascale Data Intensive Computing for eScience. And we're very uh, happy to have Alex L.A. as the presenter for this presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah. So this is a collaborative work that, uh, you know, we have been working consistently on this for the better part of last 10 years. And, and of course, you know, when we started out, the servers were very slow. Disks were, you know, 20 megabytes a second. And just to be able to deal with a one terabyte data threat from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, we thought with Jim that we will need about 20 servers at least to get an appreciable bandwidth. <clears throat> so it really all started with the collaboration with Jim, who tried to, who had a methodical approach to data engineering. So how to approach e-science problems in a systematic way. And so Jim postulated, he had this uh, couple of bullets, that scientific computing is increasingly revolving around data. And then his vision was that we have to build systems out of very inexpensive components, out of the bricks, that he liked to say, that we need to scale out instead of scale up. And <coughs> Then the other important part was that as the data sets were growing faster, and bigger and bigger, we needed to take our analysis increasingly to the data. We couldn't afford to bring the data to where the analysis facilities were. And then he had a wonderful way to approach domain scientists, and in this case, astronomers, how we started out. is He always said, give me your 20 questions, the 20 queries, and then I will design the data system for you. And we have tried this now ever since in many different contexts, and it works like a charm. So it really very quickly establishes a significant communication between the database engineers, the database scientists, and the domain uh, and the application scientists. And his last important bullet was always go from working to working. So instead of designing a grand scheme that will, you know, be designed for years and then it will take another few years to build, then instead of something like this, build a small system that works today, that does job, the job today with the understanding that we have to evolve it every year from now on. And it achieves a couple of things. So technologies today, especially in this data intensive arena, are changing so rapidly that basically many of the premises that today's design would be based upon, it's not clear whether they would hold on, whether they would be valid a few years from now. So, so by basically building flexible systems that can, that can be adapted and always satisfy a real need is much more a guarantee, uh, much more a path to success than, than having a, a grand top-down design which may be out of date by the time we finish it. So I would like to jump back a little bit, you know, almost 40 years or 40 some years to Jean Amdahl who wrote down the laws for a balanced system. And in particular, I would like to focus on the second one on where he postulated that for a real life uh, balanced system, we need about one bit of sequential IO per CPU cycle. Okay, and this was very true in Amdahl's time. And as we will see, this is actually still very relevant today. Uh, so people went away from this very heavily in the starting in the 80s when the, the multi-tier caching was introduced and people said, no, 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 this is not relevant because there is data locality and we don't care about the disk IO, we are really reading everything from the cache. 
And this may be true as long as your data fits in memory. But today, many of the scientific challenges are such that there is hopeless to even dream about having petabytes of data all in core. It, we are back to basics. We are back to the disks. And then eventually, at the low level, the data has to be streaming in from the disks. And so Amdahl's laws are becoming very relevant again today. And so we try to design a hardware with Amdahl's laws in mind and using inexpensive hardware. So, this is, so we basically wrote a paper with Gordon and Jim a couple of years ago where we just realized this trend and pointed out that how basically farther and farther we are getting away from the original Amdahl balance. And then wouldn't, and we started to talk about that wouldn't it be great to take inexpensive components and build an Amdahl machine, something that would be really very scalable. And that was the path we said, that was the beginnings of the gray wolf. So here are some typical Amdahl number. <clears throat> so if we take, for example, a typical bear wolf cluster, Amdahl number, the, look at the column on the right, it's about 0.08, so roughly ballpark figure is 0.1. Then uh, on a power, if we buy a power desktop, that's a little bit higher. If we, if we fill a power desktop, basically, with, with lots of good disks. On the cloud, on the, uh, somebody measured in the Amazon cloud, you can get roughly uh, 20 megabytes per second per computing unit. If you really stripe 10 stripes the I.O., then you can go up to about 30. So that roughly translates to a again, to an Amdahl number of about 0.1. When SC1 is based on the Livermore web pages of the Livermore blue gene, so when I add up all the I.O. nodes on the blue gene machine, so I get an Amdahl number of about 0.001, 10 to the minus 3, so because it's so heavily CPU weighted. SC2 is the Pittsburgh Cray XT3, and there again, they have, they, they take pride in being very I.O. intensive. And you can see that they are certainly better than, for example, the uh, blue gene, but nowhere near even as a, as a good power desktop. And the gray wolf that we built has an Amdahl number of about a half. After the Chicago cloud computing meeting, Oliver Ratzesberger from eBay walked up to me, and he did a quick calculation. And eBay's computer systems have an Amdahl number of about 0.81 but they have an unlimited budget, so dollar figures are not there. So, so what are the commonalities of data-intensive scientific computing? Scalable scientific computing, that's why the double S. So we all have huge amounts of data, we need aggregates, but in science, so basically we would like to look at the big patterns, but once we see something interesting, we need to drill back all the way to the raw data. So that's why so astronomers don't like to throw away the raw data, because at some point we see some sort of a transient, some sort of a glitch. We need to find out what it was, whether it was an instrumental effect or was it really a new type of a phenomenon. The requests from the data systems heavily benefit from indexing and that screams databases. So it would be ideal if we didn't have to go through all the data, only the parts of the data are already big enough in itself. The other important thing is that this is probably what is, for example, different from astronomy, from particle, astronomy is different from particle physics, that we have very few predefined patterns. So every astronomer in the world probably is doing different types of queries against the data every day. But in particle physics, there are certain particular patterns that we are scanning the data for, you know, the Higgs particle and so on. But here everything goes, we are searching for the unknown. And another pattern is that we rapidly have to extract some small subsets of the data, give me all the data around this patch of the sky, for example, and we have geospatial everywhere. And, and this is, by the way, true. So we have now work on sensor networks, on biomedical data. The same pattern seems to hold in all those cases. And when, <coughs> we, when we really have to look at a large amount of data, we are limited by the sequential I.O. And all in all, all these patterns fit the database extremely well. The only thing if, if that we would wish if, if it wasn't there is the transactions. So that, that just costs us and offers actually very little benefit for science. 
But it turns out that with SQL Server, there are some very nice ways to work around the transactions and the logging. So, so we are quite happy now. And, and furthermore, so now as people are running some supercomputer simulations, the simulations are starting to generate even more data than what is coming off of the sensors. And simulations are now also starting to become very real in biological sciences. So the biologists the protein, think of just protein folding. So I'd like to talk about the grave of hardware. So we have now about 46 servers with about 400 cores. So it's really not that many cores compared to the disks. And we have about one petabyte plus of disk, disk space. It's all Dell. Uh, the, and the cost was less than, or, or at around 700K. In that hierarchical system, so we have a tier one type of servers, and then we have tier two and tier three with increasingly more memory. So, so that, because not all the problem sizes fit in the same, uh, same pattern. Okay, so I would like to talk about a little bit about the tests that we did for the supercomputing challenge, because this really indicates in an objective way what the system is capable of. And so the, for the test hardware, we just isolated 12 servers, each of them with 22 terabytes of disks. These servers are basic Dells, about $4,000 per server, eight cores, 16 gigabyte memory. And then for each server, we had two disk controllers and each disk controller had its own disk box. Okay, and then each uh, of the servers also had an InfiniBand controller, and then we had 12 of these units essentially in three racks. On top of it, for the head node to control the whole thing, we had a Dell R900 server, which had 16 cores and uh, lots of memory, but all it was doing basically just aggregate the statistics for this particular case. And the interconnect texture was an InfiniBand switch. <coughs> So this just shows the component throughput. So why did we take you know, one controller, one disk box? Why did we take that many disks? And so on, and this shows the scalable, scalability of the controller disk boxes and the SAS lanes, the wires essentially connecting the disk box to the controller as a number of disks. And one can see that if we just, one controller, one controller saturates around one gigabyte a second, if we had basically lots of disks at it. And then, but basically the thing that we adopted was the purple figure, one controller, one disk box, where we can see that we reached saturation at around 10 disks approximately in a fully sequential scan around seven, 760 megabytes per second per controller and disk pair. So, <clears throat> so it's given this given these building blocks basically that was the optimum pairing that we lost the least amount you know from the raw speed that the disk could offer so for the data i used a, a database from the sloan digital sky survey it's actually a small part of the sky but uh, it's a seven, but it has multiple time domain observations and it's a 7.6 terabyte database and I partitioned it into four pieces and, then I, and four log files, and I replicated the whole thing on each server twice and then on all, across all the servers as well. So I created 24 copies of this 7.6 terabyte database, reaching a data set of approximately 200 terabytes. Okay, and I tried to interleave those between the different disk volumes in such a way that no, no query should things collide too much. <clears throat> and then all the servers were linked to the head nodes, and then we used a feature called distributed partition views. So when we created the results on each of the partitions, I could have actually an aggregated view of all the partition as if it was a single physical table, even though it was residing on 24 different locations. <clears throat> Software was used basically pretty standard, so Windows Server 2008, SQL Server 2008, we used the SQL I.O. to test the low-level hardware, and we used Perfmon and the SQL performance counters, and we were using SQL servers built in uh, monitoring tools again to aggregate this into little databases, into a data warehouse. 
And I wrote some SQL batch script for testing and the DPVs, the distributed partition views for looking at the results. Okay, so, <clears throat> so we are running SQL, SQL IO to measure the speed of flight. Basically, what is the hardware really capable of before we would run any of the applications? And we looked at pair volumes and then also aggregates across the server. And then afterwards, we did some simple queries, and then we looked at a real-life astronomy scenario. So these were the three things that we performed on the system. <coughs> Let's look at the first thing. So 12 nodes. The first one was a sequential read test, and the second one was a sequential write test. And on 12 nodes, we achieved a read speed of about 17 and a half gigabytes a second. Okay, so, so that's about one and a half gigabytes a second per node on, on this hardware. And the write speed was a little bit in excess of one gigabyte per second per node across the 30 disks. So this is the per volume basis. And of course, we had 15 disks, which were partitions into four, 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 and three on each of the disk box. So you can see that, this, that needless to say, the boxes with, uh, sorry, the volumes with three disks are slower than the boxes and than the volumes with four disks. And when I look at the per disk performance, it turned out that this is the display of all the different volumes across all the servers. And there is a pattern, there is an obvious pattern. Afterwards, we realized that actually those three machines were incorrectly formatted. So instead of using 64K blocks in the Windows format, we, we used the default 4K. So anyway, so, so in hindsight, we understood it. And the other one was that there are certain volumes that were faster, and, and it turns out that the controllers have the, instead of the 15 channels, or sorry, the disk box has a eight and seven split. And there were some volumes which were actually straddling two different parts of the controller. Okay, and so such a way, those volumes perform a little bit faster. So, so I think by and large, we understand every one of these. So I would like to talk a little bit more about the astronomy application data. So this is the so-called Stripe 82 of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So this is a little bit of it. So it's about 120 degrees long and two and a half degrees wide. And this area was scanned typically about, on the average, about 100 times over the 10 years that the Sloan was alive. And basically, we also took all these images and created a, we stacked all the pixels for a much deeper image. And then basically, all of this data, all of this catalog data is in a big 1.6 terabyte table. And we, I basically run the analysis on that table. And this data is very similar to the future time domain surveys, both PENSTARS and LSST. So this is why it was so interesting. To, to study this. And uh, so first, this is just a linear scan, sort of a select count, select count star from this table where I put in some simple uh, filter clauses. And you can see that we achieve, so this is running a SQL query. We are still in excess of 12, gig, 12 gigabytes a second over the 12 servers aggregate, running a SQL query. But you can also see the pattern. This is a big enough file that essentially takes up a substantial part of the disks. And as we are going from the outer sectors of the disk to the inner tracks, the speed of the physical speed of the disk is already slowing down. So the data files are, are that large. So this is really the physical behavior of the disks. OK. So this is a real query that, that I tried to run that was run by Gordon Richards and Brian Yanni at Fermilab, and it took them 13 days to run this query in, in pieces at the Fermilab Sloan system, essentially on the same database. And this was a very realistic case of a, of a pretty complex astronomy query, so I saw this, this would be a wonderful way to exercise how good the system is. And we had to build, essentially sort resort the whole data such a way that essentially objects which were next to one another on the sky were together in the results table so that we can do easy statistics over them. Okay, and this is a rough uh, workflow. So we have 
outside the gray area, those were the input tables, and then we basically had to build up a bunch of filters, then a, a, a fuzzy spatial join operation, then we had to build up a neighbor's table, and then on the neighbor's table we had to do a four-way join of about a billion objects in the end. So it's a pretty complex thing. This is the, these are the performance counters while running this query, the reads and writes and memory. And you can see again the peak read X sort of reached into the 10 gigabytes a second again over the, over the 12 servers. And this is not an idealized case. This is a real application. And here are some of the results. So basically, we partitioned the results following an idea from Maria that the data was laid out identically, but we partitioned the queries. on So each server got a piece of the sky. The whole query ran in 13 minutes instead of 13 days on the cluster. So, and it also exhibited a very nice scaling behavior. So there were some, the partitions were not exactly balanced. There were some partitions which had more objects due to, you know, more objects across the sky. And essentially the query time was exhibiting a rather nice uh, linear behavior with the object size. And the posterior analysis on the data set is amazingly fast. So this is, for example, a question, build me the histogram that how many objects have n detections. And this is a histogram in, function, in terms of n. So basically, the typical object has been observed 64 times. But I could very easily have computed all sorts of statistics that how many objects of these were variable and so on. Once I had all this data collated into this table, all these analyses are essentially trivial and running in seconds. So the conclusion, so I would, what I would like to conclude is that we have demonstrated that t using today's equipment, you know, with 12 servers, basically the whole test equipment, each of the recs is about $55,000. So for about $150,000, we were able to deal with 200 terabytes in a matter of uh, minutes and seconds on the respective analysis. Database was, the database was able to deliver about 72% of the speed of light, the speed of the hardware. So this is an unbelievably good scaling. Oh, we, were able, we are able to scale out over a SQL Server cluster in a linear fashion. <clears throat> so the scale out scenario works. The aggregate IO is really spectacular. So if I project this out for the whole cluster, we would get about 70 gigabytes a second sequential IO. Just to mention the Livermore blue gene has today an aggregate sequential IO of about 17 gigabytes a second at a cost of about $200 million. This, this was again 150,000 for the same number. And the Amdahl number for the cluster has been measured to be excellent. So it has measured to be 0.5. And so we presented this for the storage challenge. And while I was giving the talk on the floor, then I was able to run the demo in real time. And, and uh, I would also like to acknowledge, you know, substantial funding has come from the Moore Foundation, from Microsoft, and from the Penn Stars project. So this is how we basically put together the money for this cluster. And now we are porting, building real applications, so the Penn Stars, but we are also going to put a whole bunch of things from the virtual observatory where the fundamental problem with building scalable applications was that we did not really have the underlying hardware. And with this, we have now a platform that can actually serve the whole astronomy community. Thank you very much. baseline at, at Fermi, does that mean that that thing has gone away? No, so, so that will still be there. But, but you know, that, that system is, is a monolithic server. Even the data is not partitioned, which is easier to maintain. And it's quite adequate for short queries. But basically, for, for, for a complex scenario like this, obviously, it shows the limits of a single. So, so when, once we start to have ten, tens of terabytes, 
it also demonstrates that the, we need to scale out. So, so, so I think what, what the Gray Wolf will do is probably offer kind of a, a specialized workbench for the high-end users in the astronomy community who really have such complicated problems that would take days to run on the main Sloan site. And we will also offer some aggregation of other data. Sorry. Probably, I think we can probably pick up a few thousand. Today we hit about, we get about 100,000 queries per day on the main Sloan site. And I think of, of this, we, if we can shave off the, the most, complicated one to, uh, most complicated few percents and run it here, I think that would ease up the load on that system and it would still be manageable by us. Here. So, so is the, um, I, I wanted to ask a question about the, the preparation for this. It's rather uh -huh. a generic question about how much it uh, is, is pre-planned by human ingenuity and how long that takes, uh, and uh, to what extent it, it's automated, the, the distribution of the data and uh, the partitioning of the query. So right now the partitioning was still spoon-fed. So, so it was done by hand and by simple scripts. But uh, already for Penn Stars, Maria will actually show some figures. There the partitioning is, we have a much more high level view for the data, and eventually we hope that the outcome will be that we will have some generic wizards. That if somebody deploys the Gravel framework, they can essentially map the database schema onto essentially using different strategies onto the different nodes and physical resources, and then the wizard would actually do the low level mapping so that, that individual scientists don't have to muck around. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, hi, Alex. Um, a very impressive speed up. At what point will actually the speed of calculation be basically fast enough where the scientist iterates around understanding the result, submitting or working on new queries, mm -hmm. waiting for queries to complete, and then trying to understand those results? And I, I say this really in the context of, of really of green IT. You've got a very, uh, what could almost be considered an enormous amount of hardware replication and things like this. And so we have to balance out what is performance and important uh -huh. performance gains. Uh -huh. And what is, well, you know, we're, we're doing this because we can rather than because we need to. Well, I think already the 13 days shows you that we have to do this because we need to. So unless we do something, so Part of the speed up was also I did the joints a little bit better, so, so I was very carefully monitoring what was going on under the hood. So it is clear that we will need to provide all this additional information that allows people to refine the scripts for the code development and for this iterative, what I call a hit and miss loop of science. We probably should come up with a better strategy for petabyte data sets, so like we should provide a 10%, a 1%, and a 10 to the minus four randomly subsample data sets, so that I would start developing a new application on the 10 to the minus four subset, then move up to the 1% and see whether the scaling is still right and uh, am I still getting what I want, and kind of go from the personal to the, to the professional to the enterprise version of the data set, basically. I, I think that would be a good strategy. Thank you again.